Welcome to Dennis Money's Two Cents, your weekly recap of headlines and stories. I am Matt. I'm Victoria. And I'm Robbie. Two weeks in a row, people. We didn't get a fight last time. And so we are running it back. We're running it back to see if we can get a fight. And we've got some spicier topics today. So I have a feeling that we might be able to get one going. We just, we want some drama, like The Bachelor and these different types of shows. Like, I feel like they thrive on <laughs> drama, right? So like, we need, we need some. Yeah, need drama is where listeners. the money is, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll make uh, this okay. more dramatic. It makes more dramatic. Okay, uh, here we go. So uh, agenda, we're going to talk about, we teased this last week, right, Robbie, where uh, I asked the question, what happens? We kind of, we kind of talked about what if demand does not slow? Like, what does that look like? I was like, well, what happens if demand does slow? And what does that look like? So we wanted to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about the market impact of um, Americans getting skinnier, question mark. Um, and then we are going to talk again. We got your study buddy, Victoria here, to talk about a study that she was feverishly writing notes on um, about t- 15 minutes ago. Because um, this is what she Thanks does. Thanks for She's, calling me out. <laughs> no, I'm not calling you out. I'm saying you you pulled the study up earlier and then you're just like, you're consuming it so quickly and like making all these notes. It's a compliment, by the way. Um, Talk about fund manager narcissism and the impact of overconfidence in managing money. So uh, Robbie, let's jump to you. Talk about uh, the question. Let's just discuss the question of like, what happens if demand slows? Yes. Uh... I think we're more familiar with a slowing demand than with like a very stubborn demand and a strong economy. So what comes to your mind when demand slows down? I mean, I would say 70% of our GDP is consumerism. So if demand slows and people stop buying stuff at some point with that ever does happen, I would think that a natural uh, kind of follow up from that would be a slowing economy. Yeah, Maybe the recession that we've been being told it's going to happen. Yeah, for like two years now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, 100%. So given that our economy is uh, distributed, 70% of it comes from consumer consumption, around 12% comes from like business investment, and the relate, remaining part comes from like government spending and the difference between net exports and imports, demand is detrimental to economic activity in the US and in major developed countries. And uh, before we talk about what would happen and what's the chain reaction for a slowing demand, it's important to know like what would make demand slow down. And there are two aspects for it. It can be an internal uh, systematic mechanism in the market that would make demand slow down, or it could be an external shock. An external shock is, you know, COVID, uh, 9-11, a war, these type of stuff affect consumer confidence so tremendously that people's fear will tempt them to save money for their bad days and thus spend less. And each dollar spent is another person's dollar earned, and that will make less money in everyone's pockets. So for external shocks, and those usually are the scary ones because we are dealing with an uncertainty coming ahead, when people are afraid and they're not spending, take the example of COVID, not only that affects demand, but also risk in all financial assets measured by this risk premium, whether it was in bonds or in equities, also widens out. So not only do people panic, but also prices reflect that panic really quick. And Mm -hmm. that slowing down of demand is usually seen as a shock, as a crash in financial markets. The second part is usually intrinsic. It's it's related to the business cycle where, uh, you know, a new industry exists, companies flock flock into that industry offering new products. There's no competitors. Think of like Tesla in the new EV space. There are no competitors. Profit margins are really high. There's a lot of money being generated. But as the technology progress stales and there's more competition, margins start to compress and there's less money available for everyone. And that slows down business activity. People will get fired. Demand will 
you know, slow down because people are not employed anymore. So there are two, you know, sides for what would cause demand to slow down. And uh, I think in our case these days, we're more interested in the in the second example than the first one. Uh, it is demand is slowing down because now it's harder harder to conduct business at higher interest rates and margins might be affected and people might be laid off. And that's how like monetary policy works. So in that sense, demand slows down, you would see a, you know, a, a downside in financial assets, their prices will go down, maybe they'll crash for a couple of days until uh, you know, policymakers get to in a position where, hey, further decline in demand would actually have a permanent effect on the economy and we would want to avoid that. And the whole attention shifts from you know, controlling what inflation is and what an employment level is at to making sure that the economy keeps producing and making sure that everyone is still spending that dollar so someone else can make that dollar and then bring the economic cycle back into rotation. You don't want that cycle to slow down. And usually uh, what would happen is that uh, market participants would anticipate that the Federal Reserve would interfere and they will cut interest rates. So what would happen, all interest rates at the short term, short end of the yield curve, aka we're talking about treasuries that mature in a year, two years from now, money market, the interest rates on those will start dropping because everyone's flocking to safety and in anticipation that the Federal Reserve might be dropping rates. And the shape of the yield curve will actually uh, steepen because short-term interest rates are going down, which is the complete opposite of what's been happening in the last couple of weeks in the market where the inter yield curve is steepening, but it's because interest rates, long-term um, interest on rates the long end. Yeah. on the long end are going up because of higher expectations for growth and a longer lasting inflation. So on one hand, this happens. And then here's where like the role of government comes in because uh, while every dollar a consumer spends doesn't have the same impact as every dollar a government spends, it still has an impact and it can work, you know, as a buffer when no one else is spending. So usually governments intervene, they might cut taxes, they might give stimulus checks, you know, they might push in some fiscal, uh, eas easing fiscal policy. However, because coming out of a recession, uh, might require both monetary policy as in the Federal Reserve cutting rates and a fiscal policy where they are cutting taxes or they are giving tax breaks or tax credits or simply giving stimulus checks out. The fact that some of the action is fiscal, it might take longer to execute in the market. You want both political parties to push laws to go through all chambers of con Congress have the president sign on it because of this bureaucratic system, maybe the time it takes and the delay might freak market participants out and some crashes and sell-offs happen until actually the law passes until the last stages. But usually a government intervenes uh, even after some time, money is pumped into the economy and this restores consumer confidence. When that happens, credit spreads that were you know, showing up in financial markets starts narrowing down, showing an easement of risk. And hopefully that kickstarts the economy to start a new business cycle or a new growth. And uh, while it might have crashes, it's just the natural path of, you know, business markets with the ups and downs of it. Yeah, that's a great breakdown, Robbie. And, and the bottom line is, I mean, a recession is coming, right? predict a yeah, recession long point. enough like you're going to be right it's like you anticipate it's going to rain every day every day for a year you're going to eventually be right it's, it's going to happen and it and that was a great breakdown to basically say like here's kind of the, the the mechanics of it can you just for a second uh just you mentioned it and i was listening to it on a podcast this morning talking about the 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 unique like aggressiveness of the movement on the long end of the yield curve um, just over the last month, and and you just alluded to it that the yield curves really normalized for normalized in quotations here, just in the sense of like it's not totally normal for high end, or for the the short end of the yield curve to have higher yields than a long. We call that an inverted yield curve, right? 
And people always talk about that being kind of like the sign of a recession. Um, can you just speak to like uh, the, the, whether it be good, bad, or just kind of what it means when we talk about the movement on the high end or the long end of the yield curve, it's now kind of starting to steepen. And now we're kind of back to like a quote unquote normal territory of a yield curve. Like, can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a really good question because uh, people think that the yield curve moves for the short term part of it and the long term part of it move due to the same forces, but they do not. Short term interest rates, where we're talking up to like the two year, three year treasury bills, those, the movement in those is almost all controlled by the Federal Reserve because they are setting their FUT fund rate and they are willing to transact with other banks at these rates and they really have a control on you know, the, the short-term interest rate that exists in the market. However, for the long-term interest rate, it's actually influenced by supply and demand. Uh, the biggest player in the long-term end of the yield curve is usually the government issuing new bonds every single you know, week or so. And, because, and, and fund managers, right? And investors buying and selling bonds. Exactly. And because, you know, mainly on the longer term end, we're talking like pensions, endowments, fund managers, money market makers, they are transacting in those long term bonds, the 20 year, the 30 year, even the 10 year, they change the yield curve by their activity. And usually indications from the long term of the yield curve tell us about what we think real interest rates are going to be in the future or what our inf inflation expectations are going to be in the future. And the dance between those two tell us whether uh, people expect strong economic growth or uh, high inflation. So now with the, going back to your question, with the steepening of the further end of the yield curve, the long-term treasuries, uh, what does that mean? This means that most of endowments, money managers are actually selling their bonds and maybe moving to a different asset class in anticipation of a higher inflation or a, or a strong economic growth in the future. Because both high real interest rates and high inflation, which are you know opposites, real interest rates are really good on the long run. It just means there's growth in the future. And high inflation is bad because there's some, it means nominally your money isn't worth it. Both of these, although contradicting, have the same effect on a bond price. They drop the bond price as they go up. So people are selling their bonds. This is what we know, the long-term bonds. But we don't know if it's because we expect real growth in the future to be really high because the economy is going to superb. The next business cycle is going to be superb or because inflation in 10 and 20 years is still, under, is still not under control. Given other indicators in the market and what break-even rates are looking for inflation, we have a, like I personally have a bias to think that it's real interest rates in the future are going to be good. And the next stage of the business cycle is, is going to be good. But, you know, that's not enough information to make a decisive decision. And this is just part of how the money cycles and moves out of the recessionary territory. And just to add one last point, if we think that we still think that an inverted yield curve is an indicator of recession. Well, there are only two ways for it to uninvert. Either short-term rates drop, so the short-term end is lower than the longer longer end. Which means the Fed cut rates. Which means there was like a crisis, a crash. A crisis recession. they had to react to, yep. Or long-term rates go up way above the short-term rates for it to uninvert and maybe an indicator of, again, real good interest rates, uh, re real economic activity in the future or high inflation in the future. So, and it is uninverting, which means we are finally moving forward in this economic cycle out of the fix we're in. Yeah, that's awesome, Robbie. Uh, quick uh, finish on this, uh, same podcast I listened to, they were referencing since 1958, they gave um, two different figures on rates just to give some perspective. Since 1958, nominal rates average at the 10 year average right around just above 5% is the average um, since 1958. Uh, we are right there. We are right around just above 5% on the 10 year. Real rates, so including inflation, it's right around 2%, which is right where we're at, we are at. And so just to give some perspective of like all this narrative and people freaking out of the news, rates, 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 like it's more of an indication of anchoring to where we've come out of, right? Of this like 
unbelievably unique low rate environment to like now things have normalized, but because we've anchored to these low rates, I think people are uh, like the narrative doesn't necessarily meet reality because reality is we are right at average rates, right? We are right at average rates since 1958. Robbie, would you agree with that? Is that, is that an assessment? Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's so easy to fall into the trap of anchoring if you are living in a business cycle that takes 50 years to complete. Like it's yeah. so much time mm-hmm. that you'll fall into the crap of anchoring. Yeah, trap yeah. Of anchoring. for sure. For sure. Well, Robbie, that's awesome. Uh, let's move on to um, the impact of Americans getting skinnier. So <laughs> uh, have you, uh, I can't imagine you guys haven't, have you heard of the drug Ozempic? So I'm pretty sure you yes. can't go anywhere without hearing That's someone Ozempic. mentioning it. <laughs> it is wild. It is in. I heard this. I heard that word for the first time this year at the gym. Weird. Um, and since then, I think it was earlier this year. I want to say maybe end of last year, early this year. Since then, it, I hear it, it. I don't think I can go a day without someone talking about Ozempic or something like Ozempic. So for those of you that don't know, Ozempic is what's called a GLP-1 drug basically just a weight loss drug. I think the, and I'm, I am in no way going to pretend like I know the, the, the mechanism behind this, but essentially it, it, it suppresses appetite. And supposedly what it does is help or it slows the digestion of food. So you feel fuller longer. And the impact is it reduces cravings. And I was reading some studies that were talking about like lowering the impact of like craving for alcohol dropping by like 65%. Or the, and the use of alcohol by 65%, the, the snacking, the, you know, fast food um, eating, like just, it, it kind of curbs all of this, right? My favorite things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like all the good things of life. What, all why, the good why, things in life. Like, why would we cut this This sounds like my nightmare. This sounds like my nightmare. <laughs> um, but this has become extremely popular to the point where JP Morgan did a study. They are estimating that 24 million people in America, at seven, roughly 7% of the population, will be using some level of weight loss drug. There's other ones, Ozempic's the most popular, but uh, there's other ones like this uh, by 2035. So 7% of the population by 2035, which is pretty wild. So now mm-hmm. analysts and different groups are starting to like talk about and, and try to anticipate the impact of this on these different industries, industries like mm-hmm. alcohol, um, obviously fast food, um, shares of Mondelez International. So these are the makers, the makers of Oreos and Ritz crackers on this report coming oh. out dropped almost 8%. Not the t- Oreos. Not, you can't touch my Oreos. <laughs> Get out of here. Um, so uh, what's crazy about this, this is kind of like good and bad, right? This sort of the, the overall impact of this. The, the good, Bank of America released a report on this that was talking about the impact of, um, this is just wild to me. I read this and I was like, the, the level of depth and, and interaction in markets with stuff like this. You're talking weight loss drug, and then Bank of America releases a report of the net savings for the airline industry. So get this. They ran a report. They said, on average, if the average, pay, or if the average uh, f- um, passenger lost on these drugs around 10 pounds, that would be uh, about 1,800 pounds per flight. They're estimating a savings of $80 million a year in annual fuel costs because of the weight of the plane and how that impacts the drag. Like, this is wild. My jaw Um, is on the floor. (laughs) I know. I was so, I was like reading these things and I was like, so into it. It's amazing. So what say ye guys, uh, what thoughts, if any, do you have on the impact of, I mean, these drugs are, first of all, anecdotally people, I know people that are on this and it is across the board, significant difference um, of a uh, significant impact. And then also the studies are showing like across the board, these are like upwards of like 15, 20 percent of body fat and body weight that they're, they're losing. Um, so it's happening. And the, the, the amount of um, prescriptions going out for this, they're like having shortages of this kind of stuff. But what, what say you have, have any thoughts on this? I just think like, how powerful is it just across the board through like this and, and really tying it back to our industry, like how powerful the idea of a magic pill is like, that is such a selling point. Like, think about it with like our industry, like how much like that affects people's choices when somebody like, who's maybe not as great of a financial advisor or a fiduciary, like will sell people on like this idea of a magic pill, like a quick fix, because 
yeah, it's helping folks lose weight, but there's like a ton of side effects too, like to this, yep. like my mom's a healthcare professional and she sees people in the hospital, like every day having like really bad side effects to this. But yep. like, yep. I just think that is like such a powerful product marketing strategy, this like idea of a magic pill. And maybe we need to think of something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's human nature, right? To your point, Victoria, it is, it is human nature um, of, of exactly what you're saying. It's like, Hey, if I can give you a shot once, I don't know how often you get it once a month or whatever, once a week, and it's going to take care of, you know, you're going to lose 15, 20% of your, uh, or 15, 20 pounds or whatever in the, in the next month, just by taking a shot and doing nothing different. Yeah. I think human nature is like, yeah, give me the shot, give me the pill, give me the, you know, it's they, they, we, we want to collect outcomes. I don't know if human nature is such that we want to like actually put in the time and the effort. I'm, I don't blame anybody. Believe me. I'm like, maybe I'll take a shot. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll do this. No, I it think- makes sense. We want to like avoid the pain and, and the hard work. And we just want to take the, like the easier route, but then we also have to understand like the side effects. And that's I feel like a, a large part of our jobs as financial advisors is like, Hey, here's all these side effects you should know about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree. I'm fascinated by, um, this part of it, but also just fascinated about like, it just really highlights the interconnectedness of the market, right? That these yeah. analysts are running these reports on truly what could happen from a weight loss drug to like the airline industry. And then people are really starting to talk about like, what impact could this have on like the fast food industry? If you look at the numbers of what like uh, companies like McDonald's has done compared to the S&P 500 over the last like 20, 30 years, it is unbelievable. And it's like, well, does, does something like this truly, could this have, could this reverse a trend? Could this change the market dynamics? Like Robbie's laughing. I, Robbie, I want to get your take on this. I, I don't think it would reverse market dynamics. Here's a hot take. Maybe we can fight about this. But... Oh, this is it. This is it. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> but here's the thing. It's actually, I remember a couple of uh, months ago when Ryan and I were talking about BRICS and replacing the US dollar and we looked at the history of uh, how much did the US dollar actually replace the British pound and how much did the British pound re- replace the Swiss franc. And if you look at the liquidity of the British pound right now, it's at its all time high. So if I take that same analogy and throw it at fast food, I'm just going to say now people are going to be eating more fast food because they have this moral hazard that they can get rid of the weight whenever they want. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Smart. So. I'm guessing more fast food and cheaper flights to Italy. So I buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. Or maybe not cheaper flights, just higher profit margins for the for the airline. That's probably what it is. Yeah. Those airlines are not passing yeah, those they're savings. They're not going to pass that to us. They're just going <laughs> to be like, be here real. you go, shareholders, for your uh, extra profit. Uh, yeah. No, that's a good point, Robbie. I think that's a really good point. And again, I my take is, uh, maybe this is going to offend people. I'm really sorry. <laughs> but I think people, there's a different mindset of people um, just take, taking health into consideration. Let's, we're on the topic of weight loss and health. There's a different mindset around like, I'm just living a healthy lifestyle versus I'm looking for an easy way out to your point, mm-hmm. Victoria. Yeah. And I think Robbie, what you're speaking to is it doesn't change behavior, right? Mm-hmm. It's not changing right. behaviors, what you're saying. Um, it, it's, it's maybe a short-term blip, right? People are cutting up for summer. They're going to take a couple of shots and lose some weight. But to your point, it's almost like, it's like timing the market. It's almost like your success with that short-term event actually is your is a more detrimental to you long-term, I think is what mm. you're saying, right? Like, meaning you can, you can say, oh, I can cut this, this 15, 20 pounds for summer every year by taking these shots. Great, I'll do it. I'll eat whatever the heck I want during winter, bulking season, right? Yeah, Christmas you know, is around the corner. It. Christmas is around the corner. I'm gonna eat whatever I want. I'm gonna double down on McDonald's because I'm gonna just take this. Sh- That's a really good point. It's really interesting. Um, anyway, I just wanted to talk, I, I think it's just, again, talking about the inner dynamics of like the market, how interconnected things are. And then just, uh, we, everyone's talking about Ozempic right now. I just think it's worthy of talking about the impact this could have. We'll circle back on this as more stuff comes out. I think it's a super interesting topic. Okay. Let's finish with this, uh, Victoria, the, uh, our, our study buddy, resident study buddy, and we're going to get that to stick. Um, Talk, let's talk about this, the, the, the study you found on fund manager narcissism. Break this down for us. Yeah. So this study came out of Germany last year, and I think it's 
I love the psychology behind money. I like, I mean, I brought it up in, in this conversation. So I just thought it was like a, a something worth noting that um, uh, narcissism and fund managers actually does affect like performance. And um, so I won't go into detail of like how they structured this. Just trust the study. It's fine. Yeah, just studies my- show, just guys. Studies show. At least I'll tell you what the study is. Matt will just say studies show. I will. So I'll- I do it all the time. Yep. So I'll take it one step Call me further. out. Yeah. You actually <laughs> reviewed a study. Yeah. Yep. Yes, I did. So they um, did a study on several mutual fund managers, determined who was highly uh, narcissistic, medium, and low. And the highly ones were actually, I think it said like 34% more likely to deviate from like their officially communicated investment strategy. So they'll actually like silently change it behind the scenes because they're overconfident about a certain like alternative solution or or investment. And that was actually found to um, decrease their performance by 1%. So Hmm. I know there's a bunch of studies out there about like overconfidence and with, with investing. So this was not surprising to me at all. Um, so narcissism and fund managers, not a good thing, you guys. <laughs> Leave your ego at the door. I am curious. You just, I, and I totally get like, we don't want to break down like all the intricacies. We don't have time for that, but just how they determine narcissism. Was it like a questionnaire? Like, I'm just curious, do you know how they, how they determine that? Yeah, I think it was like a questionnaire and they were trying to determine like, um, like how they viewed themselves. So Got like it. that was kind of how like uh, the benchmark and some people had, you know, negative self image and people have positive and overly positive. Got it. It was basically um, an ego study. Like, are you, do you have a high ego or low ego? Sure. Sure. Got it. Yeah. And so overconfidence is like such a powerful uh <laughs> manipulator, I guess, in, in your investment decisions and yeah. it affects people. So this is interesting. I mean, we see this right all the time. And I think this seems pretty intuitive to me. Um, what the, like the higher, the more confidence you have in your ability to like outthink the market, the more likely yeah. you are to underperform the market. Like that to me, that's super intuitive, but maybe I'm taking this for granted, like just with the work that we do, Robbie, we, you've got some thoughts. You, you're geared up. You're ready to fight someone. Let's do this. Robbie's like, I'm not narcissistic, Victoria. <laughs> See, she's starting it. Yes. <laughs> I brought I love... this up because I think Robbie's starting Yes. No, this just what, kidding. She was setting up the fight. She knew the whole time. I was time. setting this up. Yeah. Well, greed is good. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> no, well, while greed is good. <laughs> this is a very regulated industry and for a good reason. Mm. So uh, just the nature of it, the fact that, why do I feel like I'm talking on behalf of all money managers? <laughs> but just the fact that you are uh, dealing with risks every single day and you're actually just throwing darts at something very random, you'll misplace whether the positive outcome is coming due to luck or to skill which feeds on our basic instincts that, oh, I figured it out and it will make the overconfidence grow. So yeah, it's it's fine to be greedy and be overconfident, but it's not fine to uh, be illegal about it or, mm-hmm. you know, deviate from regulations that have, you know, just through our trial and error figured out this is the best thing for advisors, for clients. Yeah. That, yeah, I think it, where it got like just dangerous is the fact that they would like deviate from like what they say they're doing and they would start to like uh, ignore um, like teamwork and it like they would just would stop like listening to other um, like professionals in the space. So it can lead, yeah. certainly lead to dangerous behaviors, but I, I agree with you, Robbie, it's highly regulated. So uh, I thought that was We're interesting. mostly protected. <laughs> mostly, mostly. Um, I, I thought that was interesting yeah the the notes you have here like teamwork does not appear to alleviate narcissism yeah. induced underperformance the other thing i think is interesting here that i think applies to our demographic of dentists you know it talks about here narcissism is a a driver of both more pronounced style inconsistency and risk taking among fund yeah. managers i think that's the same with dentists and probably just investors in general we just obviously work with dentists of like, I think, yeah, you're yeah. overconfident. And Robbie, you're alluding to the famous quote of the greatest uh, trick Wall Street ever pulled is making you think luck is skill. Like, again, it's back to what we were saying earlier. It's almost like you get it right once because you got mm-hmm. lucky and you think you think you were you outsmarted something. 
Um, and then you try it again and again and again, and all of a sudden you, you blow yourself up. So I think this is actually a really like a solid, like cautionary tale of a, of a, of a study to just, again, kind of reaffirm, I think what we already knew, which is like overconfidence can be a real killer. If you, again, are confusing luck with skill, or you're confusing your individual skill and you're overlooking just general um, principles of investing and staying consistent yeah. and, and that kind of stuff. So really interesting. Uh, anything else, any of the final words on this study or anything else we've talked about? I'm not yeah. as narcissistic as Victoria thinks. <laughs> <laughs> Rob is a narcissist. <laughs> Matt is a part-time pharmacist. And I'm Victoria. <laughs> uh, whoa. I, I, I had never once put myself in there, out there as a part-time pharmacist. I don't think, I think I said well, at the very beginning, are. I said at the very beginning, I am no expert in any, any of this. I'm just reading the reports, Victoria. I'm just reading <laughs> the notes. Okay. in the document. So we are going to get spicy here. We're going to, we're going to go ahead and end this. Thank you so much, everyone for listening whether it's live or on the podcast over the weekend. We appreciate it. That was our two cents. We will see you next week. Bye-bye now.